Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 23 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries both natural and supernatural from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mystery of astrology. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and I'm joined, as always, by Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So uh, we'd like to take a moment at the top of the show to thank our patrons, all of our patrons who make this show possible. And today we especially want to thank Marion M., Lisa R., George U., Amy M., and Connie W., through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at sqpn.com. You can join them and all of our supporters by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So today, folks, as I mentioned, we're talking about the mystery of astrology. So astrology has been with us, uh, mankind, ever since our beginning. It's uh, one of the oldest things uh, we know about throughout history. Uh, humans have always looked up into the skies and seen stars and wondered whether the stars have an effect on our lives. And even today, we have astrology columns and newspapers, and we have astrology websites. You can still get astrology apps on your phone. Um, millions of people believe in astrology, um, and some people even claim it's found in the Bible. So today, we'll, on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious Role, we'll be looking at the mystery of astrology. So, Jimmy, what are the what are the claims surrounding uh, astrology? Well, in in kind of the pro astrology claims, there are sort of two basic theories. You could call them the influence theory and the sign theory. Uh, the influence theory comes in two forms. There's a hard influence theory and a soft influence theory. The basic idea of both is that the stars have and planets have some kind of direct influence over our inclinations or actions or events in the world. <clears throat> the difference between the hard and the soft theory is that the hard theory would say they absolutely determine them. So there's a kind of fatalism or determinism to astrology that like if, this, if it's written in the stars, <clears throat> it's definitely going to happen. And the soft influence theory would say, well, no, um, they do influence, but they don't fully determine the outcome. So they, they may nudge us in particular directions, but that doesn't mean we don't have free will. And we can work within that influence to achieve our own goals, at least to a point. So those are both variations on the influence theory. The other theory the sign theory would say that the stars and planets don't actually influence us. They're, they, they don't have any kind of control or suasion over us, but their motions are timed in such a way that they serve as signs or signals of events that are occurring here on Earth. Okay, and so... These are two different, very different theories, but what do they have in common? What's, what's the, the common denominator? The, the basic thing is that we can chart the positions of the stars and planets and figure out something about events here on Earth, uh, like through horoscopes for individual people. Um, but uh, they differ in their explanation of why the, the motions of the stars and planets uh, signify these things or let us figure out these things. Okay. So these are the claims. And of course, the counterclaim is it's all bunk. Uh, <laughs> there is no way for the stars and planets to influence in, us in this way. And they do not serve as signs of things that are happening or about to happen. Oh, so so what do we know? What are the facts that are that we can lay out here that uh, are not in dispute? Well, um, so for humans, the sky is mysterious, and it's a source of wonder. As you mentioned, uh, the ancients have always looked up at the sky and wondered what's going on up there. They've speculated about the nature 
of the celestial bodies they see. Uh, you know, there wasn't YouTube back then. Or there wasn't <laughs> Xbox back then. So if you're a hunter gatherer and you're laying out at night, there's not much else than the light show up in the sky to watch and think about. And so, um, so they would note, we've got these patterns in the stars that at least they're patterns to us that became the constellations. And uh, they would note that although most stars seem to rotate around a fixed point in the sky, and so those are called the fixed stars, um, there are also certain stars that seem to wander back and forth against that background. And these became known as the wandering stars, or since the Greek word for wanderer is planetes, uh, these wandering stars became known as the planets. And because the stars are mysterious and they're light and they're light in the darkness and they're way up there, um, inaccessible to us, they, you know, it's easy to see how people could think, okay, they must be really special and magical. Um, they're not like anything here on Earth. And that makes it natural to think of them as celestial beings, I mean, celestial not just in the sense of being in the heavens, but being heavenly in a spiritual sense. And so consequently, you had lots of people in the ancient world thinking, okay, they're either gods or angels or spirits of some kind. And they presumably, if they're up there and they're so different and powerful, they can stay in the sky. They can probably have some kind of influence with us. And in fact, because you're watching that night light show in the sky every night, you would notice that, hey, this one constellation tends to come up right before it starts to get cold <laughs> or right before it starts to get hot every winter and summer. And so it would seem obvious that these guys are having some kind of influence here down here on events on Earth. And in Egypt in particular, to cite one example, <clears throat> the most important event of the year every year in Egypt was the flooding of the Nile. Because what this did was it, as the Nile flooded, it brought down new topsoil into the Nile Valley that they could then use to cultivate the crops they needed to survive. And so if the Nile didn't flood in a given year, it was a really bad thing. It meant famine. And um, so they would wait for the inundation of the Nile, and they noticed that the star Sirius arose just before the flooding of the Nile. And so that was taken as a good omen. And so the star Sirius played an important role in Egyptian religion. And that's just one concrete example, but it'd be very easy to see how they could think, okay, this is a celestial being that's blessing us with the flooding of the Nile, which we need to survive. And so, um, so we want to worship that star. Now, that's the way things happened in Egypt, but obviously they don't have a Nile elsewhere, and Sirius is not going to play the same role. So different cultures developed different astrologies. Uh, you know, here in the West, we're familiar with what we think of as the Zodiac, uh, you know, Capricorn, Sagittarius, Leo, Virgo, all those constellations. Mm -hmm. um, but that's based on our cultural history. If you look at the astrologies that were developed, say, in China, or in, um, the, in North or South America, they're different. Um, they, everybody wasn't in contact with everybody else. So different astrologies arose, but, um, but basically everybody came up with this same idea. And originally, astronomy and astrology and meteorology, the study of the weather, were all the same thing. Anybody who studied the sky was an astrologer. And over the course of time, as science developed, uh, they, these three different fields began to diverge from each other. So they became three separate studies, although they are interlocked. Um, according to astronomy, modern astronomy, things in the sky can have an influence here on Earth. Um, in fact, according to one of the major theories, although it's not completely unchallenged, according to one of the major theories, it was something from the sky, an asteroid that destroyed the dinosaurs and paved the way for our own emergence as a species. So that would be an obvious thing from the sky that had an effect here on Earth that it, it was rather personal to us as human beings. 
Um, in addition, uh, supernova that occur can, if they're close enough and aimed the right way, they can bombard your planet with deadly rays that could even sterilize it. And there are theories that uh, it may have been supernovas that weren't that close, but close enough to cause some of the mass dyings or extinctions mm -hmm. in human history, where we suddenly see loads of species dying for no apparent reason. Um, it's also thought that uh, things connected with the sun, such as sunspots, but the, all other things as well, potentially can cause things like ice ages and global warming here on Earth. Um, so that has a link to meteorology right there. Uh, the, so it's not really in dispute that things in the sky can have an influence. And to me, you know, you kind of have a lot of polarization between astronomy and astrology with a lot of mutual dissing going on, especially dissing mm. from the astronomy side, you know, kind of looking down on astrology. But to me, I think there should be a little more sympathy because the basic thesis that things in the sky can have an influence here is true. It's just a question of let's sort the good from the bad. What does it have an in the sky have an influence over and what does it not? And the real question is, uh, is what about the application of <clears throat> things in the sky, like the motions of planets, to our individual lives? So we're not talking <clears throat> about big global things like an asteroid impact or a supernova that sprays us with radiation. Do the motions of the planets, do they have an influence over our individual lives? Based on things that the people in the past would understand, you know, just watching the constellations and the seasons, it would be obvious uh, to them that, yeah, there's some kind of influence. And so I think we can look with some sympathy for people who have, um, you know, looked to astrology, but we do need to also look at it critically and say, well, how well does the evidence really support the claims that motions of the planets and stuff have an influence over our individual lives? So there, there are both uh, faith and reason uh, perspectives to uh, on this question. Then, uh, so let's start with the reason perspective. Uh, what is the you know, what does reason tell us about these claims about uh, astrology and its effect on individuals? First thing it tells us, based on what we've learned via astronomy and physics, is that the stars are not intelligent beings. Um, they, mm -hmm. they are big masses of fusing matter, um, most of them principally hydrogen or helium with additional elements that they manufacture as they do that. So they're not intelligent beings and it would make no sense to pray to them, um, any more than you would pray to a big rock or an electrical socket or anything else. Okay. Um, so don't do that. However, there is an interesting argument that you could make that they're alive. And this mm -hmm. is something very few people have thought of, but it's something I've thought about for a while. One of the classic problems is what is the definition of life? And uh, among the common characteristics of life is, well, it needs to consume resources. It needs to, you know, generate energy somehow from resources. Uh, it needs to sustain itself over time. It needs to reproduce itself, and it needs to develop over the course of time so you have a kind of evolution happening from one generation to another. It needs to somehow pass on material that shapes the next generation and that develops over the course of generations. Hmm. <clears throat> and if you think about that, stars do all of those things. Yeah. Um, stars generate energy. That's why they shine. They're generating it based on fuel. Uh, which is um, the uh, gas and other elements that they've stored within themselves and that they're now in the process of fusing uh, in a plasma state. Um, they then, uh, they they sustain themselves over time and then they die when they uh, either burn out or blow up. And when they blow up or otherwise discharge parts of themselves, they reproduce because population two stars all came from population one stars. Hmm. Uh, as the first generation of stars released uh, 
elements into the galaxies. They then recondensed and formed new stars. So that's reproduction. And the, they transferred material from themselves to the next generation that, um, that changed the way the next generation was because um, they made, the first generation of stars made heavier elements that then were incorporated into not just the planets, but also the other stars that came from them. So modern stars have a higher degree of metallicity. They contain more metals uh, than the first generation of stars, and that trend will continue over future generations of stars. So it looks like you have not only reproduction, but also an evolution in the types of stars from one generation of them to another. So even though they're not organisms the way we are with structured components like hearts and lungs and things like that, there is an argument you could make that they're basically sort of giant single-celled organisms that fit the definition of life. But, but which is interesting. But even if which that's is interesting, the, but even but if that's the case, <laughs> praying to them is not going to help. Okay, um, <laughs> any more than praying to amoebas would help. Okay, so uh, or midichlorians. Um, <laughs> so uh, so that's just kind of a digression. But uh, basically, in terms of influence, well, so what kind of influence could the stars have over us? Well, the ones that are known by science the kinds of influence are the four fundamental forces. Anything the stars could do to us in terms of our present knowledge would need to be cashed out one way or another in terms of one of these forces. Um, gravity, which stars do generate, has the influence, uh, has the range needed because it has unlimited range. Gravity has the range needed to influence us, which is in fact why we're in orbit around our own sun. Mm -hmm. Or uh, it, 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 so it clearly has an influence globally. The question is, does, it ha does the gravity of the sun have an influence on us individually? Well, one of the claims of typical astrology and horoscopes is that it does, that where the uh, sun is when you're born against the zodiac, that's going to have an influence on who you are. That's what's known as your sun sign. So if you're a Virgo or a Leo, it's because you were born when the sun was in Virgo or Leo. Um, but the thing is, how would the gravity of the sun at that moment, the moment of your birth, well, number one, why your birth and not your conception? Right. Um, but um, uh, how would that have any influence over you? Because gra the influence of gravity drops off dramatically as you move farther away. It, it drops off geometrically or exponentially. And so um, the surgeon or the obstetrician or the midwife that is standing over you and your mother in the delivery room has more gravitational influence over you than the sun right. as an individual at that moment. And so it doesn't seem hard. It seems hard to say that the sun's going to have a particular influence that the position of the doctor is not going to counterbalance. Well, not to mention that Everybody born in that sign does not exhibit the same personality traits. Oh, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, the next fundamental force that science is aware of is electromagnetism. And there are some people, they have what's known as the electric universe theory, and uh, we'll talk about that on a future episode. They think that e electricity has a bigger influence in the universe than uh, a lot of people think. Um, but even they aren't claiming that it did, that it's having an influence on the electricity in the stars is having an influence on you in this way. If it were, you would be able to measure it with a, just a simple piece of electronic equipment. Um, radios are built to detect certain frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. And we have all kinds of detectors that will detect electromagnetic radiation in all its different frequencies. So if the stars and planets and their motions were through electromagnetism, having an influence on you at the time of your birth that then affected your future development, we should be able to detect this and nobody has found it. Mm. Also, local electrical sources like your local TV station or your local Wi-Fi router in your house are having more of an electrical impact on you right now than the star Sirius or the 
the electricity crackling through the atmosphere of Jupiter or <laughs> what have you. Right. Then we come to the final two forces, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. Neither one of them is going to be influencing from you from the stars because their range is so short that they affect the nucleus of an atom. That's why they're called nuclear forces. They don't have the infinite or unlimited range that gravity, for example, does. So they're not going to have the range needed to affect you, which means unless there's another force we haven't discovered, and there could be, but unless there's another force we haven't discovered, um, there's no way for the planets to affect us individually in this way. And so there's no present scientific theory to provide a basis for astrology. Um, now, just because there's no basis for a phenomena that, you know, to explain it scientifically doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There are things that, you know, we're sure exist, but we have no theory to explain it. Uh, none that have been proven, like dark matter. We can demonstrate, it seems, the existence of dark matter because we can detect it gravitationally, but we have no idea what dark matter is. I mean, there are some proposals of what it might be, but we don't have scientific, scientific evidence, so we don't have a scientific explanation grounded in evidence for it. So it would be possible for astrologers to say, well, look, even if you can't provide scientific evidence to explain this, it nonetheless works. And so there is a phenomenon here, even if you can't explain it. The trouble is, as you point out, Dom, people born in the same sun sign really don't seem to have the same personality. <laughs> right. Um, now, presumably, you could give a personality test, and there are all kinds of problems with personality tests. Uh, it, and what, what do they really measure? And will the same person get different results depending on when they take the test and things like that. But hypothetically, you could um, you could have everybody take the test and correlate it with their sun sign and see if you've noticed any commonalities. As far as I'm aware, that research has not been done, although maybe someone's done it somewhere. Pretty sure it hasn't found any kind of strong correlation between your sun sign and your personality. Uh, and even know, if... If that mm -hmm. were the case, how would it be possible to to take that and look at and look at current sun signs and and apply that in some sort of interpretive matrix to the lives of individuals in front of us? Right. So you have a lot of people just kind of based on traditional principles that have been passed down among astrologers trying to forecast uh, what's going to happen to people, say, born in a particular sun sign. Although I should note, not all astrology is sun sign based, mm -hmm. but it is kind of the most common, especially when you're reading a horoscope. Um, but you look at a horoscope and the ones we see in newspapers today are all incredibly vague. Right. And, and that's a sign that this is not really giving you useful information. It's not saying anything specific and it's certainly not saying anything specific enough to be to be testable. And um, and it, it, one even suspects that's the reason it's so vague is because they need it to not be testable so that people don't lose faith in um, in the predictions that astrologers are making. Now, I should note that's the kind of horoscope you read in a newspaper, but there are personalized horoscopes. And in the past, rulers, for example, would have their court astrologer who would cast their own personal horoscope and um, and give them advice on that basis. Um, you know, we know, for example, various Roman emperors would have uh, uh, their horoscope cast. There was a, a particular astrologer that was influential with the um, Roman emperor Tiberius Caesar for example. And there's actually kind of a funny story about him. He was, uh, for a good while, Tiberius was holed up on the island of Capri before he was an emperor. And his astrologer kept telling him, oh, there's going to be good news. You're going to be recalled to Rome. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and he decided, I'm just going to have, I'm so sick of hearing this and it's never happening. I'm just going to have my astrologer thrown off the island, off a cliff. And the astrologer predicted, oh, no, today your horoscope says it's going to happen. And it did. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, a, that's a, a rare thing. Normally, 
you don't get such concrete, specific predictions that then happen. Uh, instead, it tends to be more like advice, like this would be an opportune day for you to do this, or mm -hmm. no, this isn't an opportune day for you to do this, but there's no concrete prediction that's falsifiable. An example of a recent ruler who had that kind of thing going on was Ronald Reagan. Right. Um, Nancy Reagan was a believer in, astro in astrology, and I guess to some degree, so was her husband. Um, but they had a, uh, a woman, I think she was in San Francisco, her name was Joan Quigley, and she billed herself as presidential astrologer, presumably not an official title. <laughs> um, but she was kind of Ronald Reagan's court astrologer. And according to biographies of officials in the Reagan administration, she would get consulted about like, is this an opportune day to talk to this ambassador about this treaty and, and things like that. Um, wow. So, you know, that kind of thing still goes on, but it still, it, we don't have good evidence that it works. And so the problem is not just do we don't have a, uh, a scientific theory to explain this, but it looks like we also don't have good scientific evidence that these predictions actually correlate with anything in the real world. They're all either really vague, or if you get a really specific prediction, like the world's going to end on a particular date, which actually was a prediction that some Indian astrologers made a number of decades ago, it ends up being falsified. So... um so we just don't have, from a reason perspective, we don't have good evidence for horoscope-style astrology. So from a faith perspective, um, you know, there is um, there is discussion of, of, of looking at the stars and the signs in, in Scripture, in Christian history. Um, it, I don't want to, you know, get, uh, you know, step on any of your, uh, uh, what, what you plan to say on it, but you know, is it the big question for me is, is it a harmless pastime or is it something we should be concerned about as well? But uh, I'll let you kind of give us okay. the faith perspective on. Well, the, from the point of view of Christian faith, there's been a diversity of viewpoints over the course of history. Um, one thing that and this was because this was big in the Greco-Roman world, it wasn't as big in the Jewish world, but it was in the Greco-Roman world. Um, the early church fathers had to confront this. And one of the things they said is <clears throat> that the stars do not, well, number one, don't worship them. Um, right. They're not gods. Do not worship the stars. Actually, that is something that was already there in the Old Testament. Um, but then as, they, as they're dealing with the phenomenon of astrology in the Greco-Roman world, the church fathers said, room must exist for free will. Uh, the stars do not control our fates. <clears throat> to the extent anybody controls our fates, it would be God in conjunction with our free will. And so you have, for example, St. Augustine talking about this. And so that would rule out the hard influence theory, mm -hmm. uh, because that would say it's all fated. The stars determine exactly what's going to happen. Um, so that was early on by the church fathers judged to be incompatible with the faith. That leaves us then with the soft influence theory and the sign theory. Well, in terms of the soft influence theory, what could there be ways of squaring that with, um, with the Christian faith? According to St. Thomas Aquinas, yes. If you read the Summa Theologia, and I'll have links to a couple of articles in the Summa Theologia where he talks about this, um, but according to him, the stars can't affect our souls, which are immaterial, directly, but they could affect our bodies, and because our bodies are just physical, and so they could affect our bodies and thus influence our souls and our minds indirectly say, by stirring up passions in our bodies and, you know, making us angry or lustful or tranquil or whatever that might be. And those physical sensations obviously do have an influence on the decisions we make, but ultimately our decisions are ours. We can overrule our passions and say, no, I'm not going to act on that. Um, so he would say it's possible 
for us for the stars and planets to influence us physically and that can have an indirect influence on our minds and our on our intellects to use his term and on our souls um so he has uh, so it's a kind of indirect soft influence theory that he's okay with and he has a one of the questions he asks is about you know is this morally legitimate or not as an activity and he has uh, one, of the, one of the things i really like about aquinas is he will differentiate different cases you know well in this sense yes in this sense no it's actually kind of a lot like what we try to do here on this show mm -hmm. um and so here's his answer about is this is astrology a superstitious form of divination and he says if anyone takes observation of the stars in order to foreknow casual or fortuitous events or to know with certitude future human actions his conduct is based on false and vain opinion so he says you can't just use it to you know casual things or happens matters of happenstance or to know with certainty what humans are going to do in the future because they do have this free will they're not they're not just programmed by the stars um, and so he says that would be a false and vain opinion. And so the operation of the demon, meaning the devil, introduces itself therein, wherefore it will be a superstitious and unlawful divination. If you're doing it this way, trying to find out for certain what people will do or just know little casual things or stuff like that. On the other hand, he says, if one were to apply the observation of the stars in order to foreknow those future things that are caused by heavenly bodies, for instance, drought or rain and so forth, it will be neither an unlawful nor a superstitious divination. So he's now he's operating with the science of his time that would say you could predict drought or rain based on the stars. Mm -hmm. And today we'd say, well, actually their influence is a little more indirect than that. Although you could learn some things about like, are we going into an ice age right. or, or warming phase? Um, but, um, but he's, he's basically, he's doing an early form of the differentiation that later happened between horoscope style astrology and the modern understanding in astronomy of the real influence that uh, things uh, in the sky can have on Earth. Mm -hmm. So he's already got that split in mind. He's just working with the science of his day. Right. Um, so he's not giving it an absolute thumbs down. He's giving it thumbs down in one circumstance, but not in another. And so actually, during a lot of Christian history, uh, including the Renaissance period and afterward, there, were, there was a good bit of, of astrology that was going on in Christian circles. Uh, you had people like John Dee in England, who was a uh, astronomer uh, or astrologer for uh, the Royals in England. He was recently mentioned in an episode of Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. um, you also have famous astronomers like uh, Tycho Brahe in Denmark or Johannes Kepler in Austria, or even Galileo Galilei in Italy, all of them were not just astronomers, they were also astrologers and made astrological predictions. Uh, you even had, and it wasn't just kings that would have court astrologers to advise them on things, popes did. So, um, for example, we know of a guy named Lucas Garicus, uh, uh, who was the court astrologer for both Pope Leo X and Pope Clement VII back in the 1500s. So, so if if anyone is trying to say, well, this is the church has just always condemned this and condemned it absolutely. No, the story is more complex than that. Mm. Uh, the church has always opposed some forms of astrology, like attributing absolute destiny to the stars or a hard influence theory, but it hasn't always been opposed to everything, um, and. Uh, one reason for that is the Star of Bethlehem, of because when you've got the Star of Bethlehem there in divinely inspired scripture, 
signaling the wise men that the new king of the Jews has been born. It seems like at least some version of the sign theory has to be true. Um, now, one thing, and we'll do, in fact, uh, we'll do a future episode just on the Star of Bethlehem, at least one. Um, I've got it tentatively slated for next year's Christmas episode. But just uh, uh, one thing, the, the, the wise men did not actually follow the star. That's not the way Matthew presents it. Mm -hmm. The star alerted them to the birth of Jesus, but then they had to ask, where is he going to be, and got told Bethlehem. And then when they set out to Bethlehem, they providentially see the star in the sky in front of them and go, oh, wow, what a coincidence. They're not actually following it, but it is serving as some kind of a sign that the king of the Jews has been born. And um, and so it, it you could say, well, the hard theory is definitely false. The soft theory you could also say is false, at least in terms of influencing us as individuals. But it does look like God can providentially time astronomical events so that they correspond to events at least, not if not in our individual lives, to his overall plan of the ages. And so sometimes you have had Christian scholars uh, writing about what is sometimes called the gospel in the stars, uh, that you can, by studying the constellations, at least as they were identified for the Jewish culture that was under God's guidance, you know, the constellations that God, in the course of their history, allowed them to identify, you can read kind of the gospel, you know, uh, up there with Virgo, for example, representing the Virgin Mary, and mm -hmm. the other constellations representing things. So you'll find books about this that have been written by Orthodox Christian scholars. This is not church teaching. So right. this is theological speculation, but it's not church teaching. And it's also, it hasn't been either approved or condemned by the church. Um, but there is at least some traction in Scripture for the idea that God can use celestial phenomena as signs. And the Star of Bethlehem is not the only one. Um, the uh, There's another. If you look back in Joel, this is Joel chapter 2, verses 31 to 32, Joel, an Old Testament prophet, has a prophecy where he says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and it shall come to pass that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we've got something happening where the sun is darkened and the moon is turned to blood. Well, at and then that's connected with people calling on the name of the Lord and being saved. Well, it would be natural, given that conjunction of elements in prophecy, for early Christians to apply that to the death of Jesus at the crucifixion when the sun was darkened. We don't know by what. Could have been clouds, could have been a dust storm, could have been something even more miraculous, but something caused the sun to darken while Jesus was on the cross. Was the moon turned to blood? Well, guess what? On the night of the crucifixion in A.D. 33, there was a lunar eclipse visible from Jerusalem. Hmm. And lunar eclipses can make the moon look red because the uh, light of the sun shines through the Earth's atmosphere and gets bent in a way that it casts a reddish tinge on the moon. And so um, we then find St. Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it's verses 20 and 21, he quotes Joel's prophecy and applies it to the death of Jesus. And he may, and scholars take it seriously, that he may be thinking not only of the darkening of the sun that happened during the crucifixion, but of the lunar eclipse that was visible from Jerusalem that night. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, the idea is, I'm trying to reframe this then. So, the the stars, you know, we reject the idea that the stars have a hard influence, that we don't have free will, that we have fated or destined based on the stars in the sky. Um, mm -hmm. And then even soft influence, the, you know, that's a, it's, yeah. it's a tough a little, sell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that God can use uh, the phenomena in the skies to tell us something, to communicate to us. Um, and that, that is something that we can then, we could, we could look at and, and, mm -hmm. and, and be part of our faith. Okay. 
Right. And in fact, in Genesis, when God creates the stars, it even says, let them be for signs in the heaven. There's a question of signs of what? Well, it could just be signs of seasons. Yep. You know, you're going to, the summer's going to start now. But it could also be signs of more specific things in God's plan. Okay. There's even an argument, and we'll talk about this in a future episode. I know we just had an episode on Jesus's birth, but we'll have more discussion in the future of that. Uh, because there's a, a theory that some people have advanced um, based on Revelation, where you John sees in Revelation 12, he sees the sign of the great woman in heaven, and she's got a crown of 12 stars, and she's clothed in the sun, and she's got the moon at her feet, and she gives birth to a male child who's clearly Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, he sees her in the heavens, in the sky, and with the stars and the sun and the moon, if you take this, as astronomical, he would be talking about Virgo, which classically was thought to have a crown of 12 stars. And if you then say, well, she's clothed in the sun, so the sun would be mid-body on Virgo, and the moon would be at the feet of Virgo, Ooh. that would point you to a specific time that is actually is not going to happen that often. You're not going to have that conjunction with the sun and the moon in those positions at Virgo very frequently. It's not going to happen that often. So let's look at the time around the lifetime of Jesus and say, did that ever happen and when? Well, it did happen on September 11th, 3 BC, hmm. for a very brief period of time. And since this is representing the birth of the man-child who is Jesus, guess what? According to the Church Fathers, Jesus was born in, 40, in 40, the 42nd year of Augustus Caesar, which corresponds to the back half of 3 BC and the first half of 2 BC. So some people have looked at this passage in Revelation and say it is dating the birth of Jesus Christ astronomically, and it would have been September 11th, 3 BC, wow. according to this argument. Right. Wow. Amazing. All right. So that's a lot to take in. Now, this, the, the, we talked about the historical Christian perspective. What does right. the church teach us today about about this? So the church doesn't presently have a, an endorsement or disendorsement of the sign theory. We've already covered that. Uh, mm -hmm. It will definitely disendorse the hard influence theory. In terms of the soft influence theory, uh, as applied to us as individuals, so horoscope astrology, here's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church has to say. This is paragraph 2116. All forms of divination are to be rejected. Recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. Consulting horoscopes, astrology, palm reading, interpretation of omens and lots, the phenomena of clairvoyance, and recourse to mediums, all conceal a desire for power over time, history, and in the last analysis, other human beings, as well as a wish to conciliate hidden powers. They contradict the honor, respect, and loving fear that we owe to God alone. And so the exhortation here in the Catechism, do, absolutely do not conjure up Satan or demons. Um, <laughs> but <clear>. even, <clears throat> even consulting horoscopes and so forth is something that ultimately betrays a lack of, according to the Catechism, a lack of trust in God and the providential care that he gives us and so forth. Interesting. So even if they could um, provide us the information that we seek, the the act of looking for that information uh, is itself. Well, yeah, and one could take that interpretation. Um, I would argue, though, that the catechism is assuming or presuming that they don't give us that information. Okay. I think if it were shown that, oh, hey, the stars do have some kind of influence that we can show scientifically, then it would fall in the same category as, you know, using them to predict the, you know, the seasons or something like that. And the catechism would then probably get revised to say, you know, except where it actually works. I think it's okay. assuming it doesn't work and therefore it betrays a superstitious lack of trust in God. If God built creation to actually give us this information and we could show that, then it would be just relying on information God gives us through his creation in this circumstance, like in others. Like, if you see an asteroid coming, get your space program on it right away. <laughs> right, right. 
Okay. Um, all right. and, and we've seen that in other areas as science has advanced and given us more insights yeah. into the world that God has yeah, given us. Like, like medicine. Originally, some medicine was like, oh, this is all in God's domain. Don't mess with this. But then as we've learned more, it's no, God is giving us knowledge of how this medicine works and it's okay. So what's the uh, the bottom line when it comes to the mystery of astrology? Well, the bottom line, as far as I see it, is uh, things in the sky can have an influence here on Earth. Uh, horoscope astrology, though, is is bogus. It's not supported by the evidence. Um, but God can providentially time events in his plan so that they are also signified in the stars. All right. So, and as as usual, we have some further resources that'll be in the show notes. Um, yeah. One of those? Um, so I'll have uh, links to Wikipedia's articles on astrology, as well as the Christian views of astrology historically and Jewish views. Uh, there's also a link to an article in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Now, I want to say just a word of warning about this article, because it was written about 100 years ago, and the guy who's writing it has a bit of an ax an axe to grind. <laughs> he 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 makes it sound like oh everybody from the beginning in the church was absolutely opposed to astrology. And he's really overselling it. And yeah. given what he seems to know about about it, I mean he admits later like popes did have astrologers and stuff. But given what he knows about this subject, I I think he's deliberately suppressing things he knows. Like he never mentions Thomas Aquinas's views here. Uh, which are very balanced and moderate, and he just leaves those out. So there is useful information there, but be aware, the guy is not giving you a balanced picture of what actually happened. He's giving you kind of a distorted picture. Okay. Uh, then finally, just so you can see what Aquinas himself had to say, I've got links to a couple of places in the Summa Theologia where Aquinas does talk about this, so you can read him for yourself. Excellent. So, and then in Mysterious Feedback this week, we're going to uh, talk about some of the feedback we got on the uh, episode where we talked about Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple. And uh, our first feedback comes from our friend, uh, the Kurt Jester, uh, Jeff Miller. Another great episode, he says, although I was a bit surprised that Julian the Apostate's attempt to rebuild the temple was not mentioned. He wrote, I will use all my zeal to make the temple of the Most High God rise again. Uh, and then he, he says that author Rod Bennett refers to this colloquially as double dog daring Christ's authority. Um, but Ammianus, Julian's friend, wrote of the multiple setbacks that included earthquakes and fireballs resulting in, in the uh, uh, or stopping the attempt to rebuild the temple. And uh, I, in Jeff says, I believe there are multiple historical sources for this. Perhaps you have a future episode in mind regarding this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Julian the Apostate is a fascinating figure who himself is, in some ways, you could view him as a forerunner of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I I look forward to talking about that more in the future. And he did try to rebuild the temple as part of his project. He was trying to smash Christianity by encouraging people to go back to their ancestral religions, which meant for Gentile Christians, he wanted them to start worshiping the pagan gods again. For Jew Jewish Christians, he wanted them to go back to Judaism and was going to build their temple for them. And then things took a different course. <laughs> um, so that ended up not happening. But we'll talk about that more in the future. Okay. And then uh, RCS Curtis on Facebook says, uh, I've heard that from a Christian perspective, there will never be a new temple because Jesus is that temple. Any thoughts on that idea? It is something that has been proposed. Um, the If you look at the end of the book of Revelation, when John sees the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, he says he does not see a temple in it because the Lamb, meaning Jesus, is its temple. So certainly in the eschatological future, in the eternal order, it, the way the Bible depicts it, we won't have a, a temple. But uh, Jesus himself serves as the temple. But whether that applies to the future in our age, before the second coming, before Jesus brings in the eternal order— is something that people have different opinions about. Uh, some have said, uh, no, there will not be a new temple, and that's why God stopped uh, Julian the Apostate from being able to rebuild. Others would say, no, there will be a new temple, and we have some indication of that in Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it just wasn't the right time for the temple to be rebuilt, and that's why God stopped Julian the Apostate from rebuilding. So there are different views on that, and we'll be talking about them in future episodes. Excellent. 
And then on YouTube, Jim writes, these vids challenge my intellect and raise my spirit. Way to go, Aiken. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Jim. And I want to thank uh, I, my co-host, Dom, for all the work he does in uh, in bringing these episodes together. And he does a lot of stuff, not just here during the show, but behind the scenes. Peter deserves a lot of thanks and a lot of credit. And I'm glad you're enjoying the show. And please uh, share and recommend with your friends. And and thank you, Jim, for that. Uh, yeah, we uh, we we, we love doing the show. Yeah, we we yeah. work together on this. Um, so then, uh, mysterious headlines. What do we get this week in mysterious headlines, Jimmy? So people may remember uh, a couple of years ago there was a star that astronomers found. It's colloquially known as Tabby's star because of the astronomer who focused on it. Um, that possibly has alien megastructures surrounding it, like if someone's in the process of building a Dyson sphere or something around the star because it has this bizarre dimming and brightening pattern hmm. that is hard to explain uh, through known natural phenomena. Um, they considered a bunch of options, like could it be a comet swarm? Could it be a dust cloud? And there are problems and so with those options. And so um, some astronomers proposed, well, maybe they're building something big and huge and irregularly shaped around it that would block light from the star in this way. Well, now there's a second star hmm. that has been found that is a candidate for having alien megastructures around it. And so I'll have a link in the show notes to an article from Scientific American talking about the new potential alien megastructure star. And now, as before, there may be and probably is a natural explanation. And now that we have a second star that displays characteristics like this, we might be able to have a better chance of figuring out what it is. Um, thus far, all of the astronomical phenomena that have been thought to maybe signal alien life hasn't, haven't. On the other hand, maybe we'll get lucky and this time it will. <laughs> Excellent. All right, what else do we have? Uh, well, speaking of outer space, you know, if it turns out there are aliens around this star, we may want to defend ourselves from them. And so that brings us to an article about the plan for creating the U.S. Space Force. Um, this is something that President Trump has been talking about and pushing the military to do. And so I have an article from DefenseOne.com, which is a defense website, uh, talking about the plan to create the U.S. Space Force. And Personally, I am on board. We need a space force, and not just for dealing with aliens, but for dealing with some uh, other nations here on Earth that we also need to defend ourselves against in space. Should it come down to a shooting war, we do not want our GPS system to suddenly go down mm -hmm. and deprive U.S. resources of that of the navigational aid it, it provides. So uh, right. for information and communication reasons, we need our satellite system protected, and that means a space force. Right. There's a tendency to be kind of uh, in the media or in just in general, kind of be dismissive of, of these things. But uh, there are there are people who are taking this seriously in our in our military. So that's interesting. I'm, I will look forward to reading that. Uh, and the uh, there's a third uh, headline. Yeah. So um, once you once we've secured planet Earth, we might want to go a little further. And if when we visit Mars, the good news is that we've found a lot of water there. There is a 50 mile wide frozen Martian lake that mm. has uh, just tons and tons of, of water in it that apparently if we melted it and processed it and filtered it, including of all of the little microorganisms that I think live on Mars <laughs> in all likelihood, um, it would be enough to provide a Mars colony with water for uh, for, I think, hundreds of years. So uh, there are also neat pictures of the frozen Martian lake. It's like circular and very thick, and you could totally go ice skating on it. So <laughs> check that out. You could probably get a, 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 what's a, a quadruple axle or what, 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 oh, one of those finger skating things. Low gravity, absolutely. <laughs> well, I can't wait for the Martian Olympic. Uh, well, that yeah. brings us to the, uh, to the end of the show, folks. Um, so... What do you think of this? Uh, the, what we had to say about the mystery of astrology? And, uh, do, you know, do you follow your horoscope? Uh, uh, you know, did did it change your mind about anything? Did it introduce? Did we introduce any interesting new ideas? Uh, so let us know by going to sqpn.com slash mysterious or to the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leave us some feedback or send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. 
Remember to to like the episode on our Facebook page or to retweet it on Twitter. Uh, definitely subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet subscribed on in iTunes uh, or wherever uh, it, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube where you should hit the bell to get notifications in order to be notified when we post a new episode there. Share the podcast with your friends and write a review in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to help us grow the community and reach more listeners. You'll find the relevant links from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thank you so much, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bethanelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>